Com. This show is brought to you in part by The Loft, where you'll find supplies for all your creative pursuits and gift buying desires. Open Tuesday through Saturday, 10 to 5. That's The Loft up the Sunstrom Mall stairs in downtown The Loft. You're listening to 88.3 FM K3 Way in The Loft. <laughs> And good morning, everybody. Peggy Berryhill here at KGUA in Wallala right now. Welcome to Peggy's Place on a chilly coastal morning. We are not used to this kind of cold. I'm looking at Erin Gaffel, who's down at the Sea Ranch Lodge. She's got on a beanie, a, a, a neck scarf, and a jacket, and gloves. <laughs> and... Uh, I, I get it. We are just not used to this this kind of weather on the coast. When the coast has, uh, yesterday we had, uh, it was almost like snow. Everything was white here at the station. My feet were crunching as I walked into the to the office. So uh, <laughs> anyway, wherever you are, we welcome you to Peggy's place this morning. Aaron Gaffel and Tom Burningham have been with us for the first month on this Friday every Friday, and uh, we've been loving sharing her work, meeting her artist fans who follow her along from around the world. It's also bittersweet, as you know, I have to say. She's putting a hat on. She's all, oh, you should see how, you must be cold in her studio. Look. She's cold. <laughs> so, uh, cold where she is, too. As, so also, am I me? No, I'm not muted. Okay. And also, um, just because of what's going on in the world. You know, our hearts go out to the people in Ukraine and uh, it is just unfathomable that this kind of evil is the only <clears throat> thing to say uh, about what's happening. So our, my thoughts and prayers are also with all of their families and relatives all over the world. And, um, you know, not surprising that we're gonna see an upwelling of art around the world that relates to Ukraine and to war and against war. Up, oh, she took her hat off. Up, oh, she put it back on. All right, so we're gonna get started. Uh, I don't have any, uh, I better double check. No community announcements. Those of you don't know, we are located at the very tip of the Mendocino coast. And, um, oh, Aaron, you have an event this evening at the lodge the sea ranch lodge will be there and also saturday there will be a, a community paint out with aaron at the sea ranch lodge and uh, at the arena theater uh tonight the film bell opens so that's about all i'm gonna say for now but i look like a i don't know some kind of underground <laughs> So, um, <laughs> so Aaron, go ahead and say something. Yeah, um, tonight at seven o'clock, we will be doing a slideshow here at the um, Walala Art Center, and I'm going to be sharing, kind of weaving together the strands of five generations of my family's making art in California, going back to the 1860s, actually, but it's not going to be a history lesson. It's really going to be a visual feast of images and stories and growing up at Nepenthe and Big Sur and the 60s and 70s and all the different um, influences that have affected my making of art over the years and also the the importance of making art you know right now again there is kind of there can be a, a freezing of creativity because 
the dread and and the um, terror, the anguish that people feel confronted with, as you said, this evil. And I have found for myself that if I can just pull, just continue to use art to express, it not only creates a, a connection with other people, which is so important, but also it maintains for me, it regenerates for me the ability and the energy to act for the good. And uh, what we really run into is becoming paralyzed, demoralized, and disengaged when we're overwhelmed with um, really terrible things. So finding a way into your own energy source through art making, dancing, singing, painting, working with color, putting a bouquet of flowers on a table, you know, wear, wearing colorful gloves. Um, you know, color is a powerful, powerful agent to activate us. And in times that are especially dire, we need to be activated. And this is a way we can do that. Mm, thank you for that. In times that are so dire, and yes, we are all feeling that in one way or another. And uh, also a big shout out to Tom for all the work that you've done and continue to do with us. But all of your artists with all of your colors and all dedicated, um, ready. We've already got 41 people uh, joining us on this day. For those of you uh, who are... Uh, anywhere you can watch this, uh, I believe, on our YouTube channel as well. So you can see Aaron, you can see some of the artists and the art that is going to be creative. I need to talk about color. You can't see it much, but I've got on my, my teals and my pinks and uh, even a burgundy uh, also to, um, like you said, to sort of keep the heart moving, keep the energy flowing and not get stuck in that very terrible spot of fear. So let's go forward with whatever you've got going. I have the, the pleasure of getting to see uh, a little preparation uh, as uh, Aaron was getting ready. Yes, and I'm just going to ask Tom if he can bop around to my screen and my computer's trying to tell me something and he might know the answer. I don't have my glasses on and I can't, I can't <laughs> read it. Um, so yeah, so today what we're going to do is a simple um, but not easy exercise in color mixing. And um, I'm going to start off mixing the color green because historically green is the hardest color. And uh, especially if you're painting nature, you go out there, especially here. I mean, I'm surrounded by these redwood trees and it's green, 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 green. And red is in most natural greens. When you're out in Cal on the California coast and you're looking at redwood trees and oak trees and cypress trees and all these you know, um, grasses that are growing so greenly right now. And we've been blessed with rain. So there's a sparkle to that. You know, you might think, oh, it's just yellow and blue because when we're, when we're in kindergarten, they say yellow and blue makes green. Um, and, but then we find that that doesn't quite do it. it. doesn't quite give us the depth, the breadth. There's a lot more going on than that just simple yellow plus blue equals green. It depends on what kind of yellow you're using. It depends on what kind of blue you're using. There are many different pigments that we can use to mix to create what we want. So, um, and red is in almost every, every green that we see here. If we were in a more tropical environment, wouldn't that be nice? Um, we might see different tonalities, but there is a lot of, of red in particular here. So I already have set up on my, on my um, notebook um, a stripe of blue, yellow, and red. These are the pigments we're going to be exploring today. And then I might go on and bring in more variety in different pigments just to show you um, what I'm talking about when I say yellow and blue doesn't necessarily make green because... Um, that's helpful to understand. Often people find they are just getting mud when they mix these colors together and they don't know why. 
And in fact, it's because they're probably using um, a yellow and a blue that make a more muddy color if they were using a clearer yellow and a clearer blue. And those are just things you find out as you go along because there's nothing like experimenting and making mistakes to learn what you want and didn't get to make you go back and do it again and figure out, well, what's wrong here? So I'm going to start today by just making a um, mixture in the center of my palette. This is sort of the way we we I'm, I'm going to I'm just reorganizing the furniture here so you can see it on your screen. I'm working with a child's um, a child's watercolor kit. This is an inexpensive way to get started. Um, and that's nice to have something that you didn't spend too much money on to get going. You might quickly find you want something a little more expensive or a little more sophisticated, but you can do a lot with a little. And if you look around in your own home, you might find you have old art supplies from projects long past that have resurfaced now as you become more interested in painting or exploring so um, look around, you know, maybe something from high school days, college days, um, your kids stuff, you know, tempera, paint, whatever, grandkids stuff. Don't feel like you have to go break, break, break the bank to get started with painting or exploring. Use what you have, start where you are. So I'm going to take this yellow here and I'm going to just make a pool of this yellow in the center of my my uh, mixing my mixing palette. And the thing about watercolor is you need to have enough pigment and enough water to really get a nice tone going. And that's important because sometimes we pick up the brush and we touch a color and we put it down and not much happens. And that's just because there's a little work that ta it, it takes a little work to really activate these cakes of color. So I'm taking my brush. This is actually Tom's brush and it's beautiful um, collapsible brush with a wonderful tip that I'm dipping into the water and then into this ultramarine blue. And I'm really rubbing into the, the cake to get that to wake up. And then I'm putting that down on another section of my palette. You'll notice that the lid of this child's um, watercolor kit has partitions, and that's what these are for. It's to be able to create pools of luminous color that you can then mix together and make the color that you're looking for. So I'm, I've got a nice pool here of blue, and I'm adding more water with my brush in that pool a little bit a little bit more spacious. And I'm gonna make a little pool over here with some of this red also, because I wanna show you what happens when you take a little, a little yellow and a little blue and a little red, and you make a green out of that combination. And when I say a little, a little, a little, what I really want you to notice is the proportion because that's what makes the difference. You might use three pigments, water, the same brush, the same paper, and end up, you could end up with a, a myriad of different options. I'm sure there's a mathematical number that would be the, close to what it would be, but it's a lot, let me tell you. So as these paints here are drying, I'm going to just mix up a square of mixed green. I'm taking my yellow and I'm going to put my yellow in another, clean that out first, another uh, into this square and picking up the yellow and putting it into that square. And then I'm picking up a little blue and putting it into that square, more blue. So the proportion, the proportion, how much until it looks good. So here I have a green, it's becoming a green and you're gonna really see it when I put it on the paper where I lay down this first square of what is a very blue green. And I just wanna give myself enough of this square of color 
to really see it, to, to really understand what kind of a color that is, how transparent it is. That's based on how much water there was. Another variable. Uh, it's time for me to remind you, you're listening to KGUA in Wallala as we are watching our friend, uh, artist, Erin Gaffel, and you can watch this live on YouTube as you will also see some of her uh, followers. Are, and she's teaching us basic color mixing. And I'm just in awe of this as she's working with a small paint kit for children. She's been using this for a month now and teaching us about colors. So if you are listening and wondering who you're listening to and why she's talking about color, join us on YouTube. KGA's YouTube channel. And uh, back to you, Erin. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Peggy. Um, so I have this green here that's drying and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, well, I'd like to actually make something that's a little bit richer. I want a little more blue. I want a little more yellow. Maybe I don't want as much water in it. So I'm gonna mix up another color using the same base, the same, the same pigments, and I'm gonna make another square. So this is just intensifying my color. I'm adding a little more blue, I'm adding a little more yellow, and I'm getting a little bit more color. And I'm gonna actually just go back into both of those, yellow and blue, put them into my pile, not adding any more water to that. So what I'm hoping to get is a richer tone, a richer and more intense color. And I'm just going to leave that alone, rinse off my brush and find a little tissue in this little watercolor kit here. So having a tissue at hand or a paper, paper napkin, paper towel, it's very handy if you wanna get in there and clean off your mixes. When you're working with watercolors, you're really wanting to have control over your color. And that means you don't wanna have little bits and pieces of other colors sneak in. Now, sometimes that happens and you end up with a happy accident as my mother likes to call them. Um, but happy accidents can also be unhappy accidents and you can get really frustrated um, and walk away from learning when you're, when you're dealing with too much frustration. So a little frustration, it's good for us, you know? I mean, it's really builds our resilience. We never had anything not go our way. We won't learn how to deal with real life. And it really, when you're, when you're making art, it's always the metaphor of everything else is inherent in what you're doing. Um, so minimizing frustration is good in the beginning because you really don't wanna get defeated right off the bat by just things you didn't know. I didn't know when I started painting that you could go back over watercolor with a layer and another layer and another layer to intensify your colors. And I felt, just felt like my watercolors were so wimpy. I must not be a very good artist. And I just didn't even paint again for many years. And it was simply that I didn't know that. And then one day I signed up for a class. My teacher walked me through the process and it was like the light bulb went off. So um, a little bit of information can really take you into painting um, with, with fewer frustrations in the beginning. So I have these two greens now, they're drying. I have this one mixture that is a little paler, a little bluer, and I have the second mixture that has more yellow, it has more blue, and you can see here that the, the color is kind of pooling up at the edge. So I'm going to take my dry brush and lift, I'm just touching it. That water wants to be absorbed into the brush and I'm lifting it off just to dry off that pooling. So I don't really want that there. And now I'm gonna do something different. I'm gonna do it in a different way. I'm going to get the paper wet. I'm making a little square with my brush water where I've been rinsing out my brushes. You can see it has a little bit of tone from the dirty water. I'm going to add in some yellow from that pool that I just mixed up. 
And I have, I'm flooding, I'm literally flooding that, that square with, with pure yellow pigment. And I'm going to now clean off my brush, pick up some water, pick up some more blue from my mixing area. And I'm going to just go into another section of this wet square. And I'm adding the blue into that wet square. So I have a yellow on the left, a blue on the right, and they're both entering into this watery world. And I'm taking my clean brush and I'm just going to coax the blue over into the yellow and let those colors merge and see what happens. I'm moving some of the yellow over into the blue, moving the blue over into the yellow. So I'm actually doing all of this color mixing in a wet square of water on the paper. And I want to see how that might be kind of interesting, might be kind of a way to get a color that might be more fun, more surprising. And I'm going to let that dry. So this is this other variable, the variable of time, allowing things to dry, allowing things to really sink into the paper, allowing the water to do the work that you are you know, inviting that participation from the materials you're working with. You're not in control of everything. You're in control of some things, but not of everything. And so working with watercolor is definitely a way to um, invite something that is very powerful and has a mind of its own, you know, this sort of uh, watery world. Um, the water plays a big role in what we're doing. Too much water, then you have kind of wimpy, wimpy color, too much color, then you lose your transparency. If I um, mix up some artist's grade paint, and I'm going to switch over here now to Tom's, Tom's little paint kit. So you can see he's actually squeezing tubes of paint. I'm going to grab a tube just to show you. Do you really know you want to go for more intense color than you're getting with a, um, a, ch a child's kit or a beginner's kit, you get little tubes of paint like this and you squeeze them out into your palette that might look like this. And here I'm going to waken up a blue on this palette. This is, looks like a cobalt blue to me. So I'm taking my brush and I'm getting this really rich artist's pigment awakened. And then I'm going to just paint this as a square on my piece of paper. Now look at that. That is intense color, rich color. And because it's got less water and it's higher pigment, it's more opaque. It's not as transparent as that first mixture series was. So I have this, um, this blue now. Oh, this looks like we might've lost our visuals on the, the blue. So I'll just describe it and Tom will fix things for us. So this blue is just incredibly uh, vivid, incredibly, um, incredibly intense and somewhat opaque. And we're going to have to sort of scooch that over here. Let's see if we can, we're going to have to do a little finagling just to get our, just to get our visuals back on here. So I'm just doing a little turnaround. There we go. And those of you on radio, listening on radio are missing. A, 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 right, missing the movement of the <laughs> camera, Tom and Aaron, we've just all gone completely upside down and now we're back in, yeah. in order. Um, and I love that cobalt blue. I love that. And I love that mixture, that other square that you did that has, yes, that one, the, the blue, the dark green and, and that uh, yellow color, really fun. So uh, this is Peggy again at KGUA in Wallala as we are enjoying these art lessons that, you know, and, and I just, uh, I probably shouldn't bring this up now, but Aaron, you know, I've been watching and I keep thinking, oh, I could do this. And then this editor in my brain keeps saying, oh, but you can't. <laughs> you know? Oh, for sure. So, you know, this is when you politely invite that, that 
that voice in your brain to, you know, take a, a day off because we have very strong self-criticism protective devices in our psyches. And they're really protecting us from getting hurt because we're afraid that if we make a mistake, something terrible is going to happen. And so this little part of our brain that is just um, so incredibly self-critical pops in and tells us, don't even bother. You're going to really not do well and don't, don't waste your time and let's let, let the artists do the art, you know, um, and, or whatever. I mean, the conversation in my family often was that, you know, we had an artist in our family. His name was Cave Facet, and he was the artist in our family. And I looked around and I thought, well, his sister, Holly, my mom, she's incredibly artistic. My aunt Dorcas is incredibly artistic. My aunt Kim is making these incredible combinations of colors and fabrics and she, she makes quilts with baby hats and they're so perfectly chosen, all the colors and textures. So I thought this is so strange that, you know, all of these artistic people, yet one is the artist, right? So um, this is often what happens in a family where you have the one artist and then you have the one sort of accountant mind. And then you, you know, the serious, the less serious, the rebel um, yet all of these things are really in each of us. So at some point you may have to discard that story that we tell ourselves and that we've been told by our families or by our schools, by our communities of who we are supposed to be, what we're supposed to be like, and listen to something else that might be truer. And it takes some time to start listening to that voice that encourages you to explore something, even though you may not be very good at it, even though you may not have mastery in that thing. And in fact, when I'm teaching, I'm teaching a two-day workshop right now here in, at the Walala Arts Center. Most people who are coming to my workshop have tremendous mastery in something, like right? They're lawyers, they're doctors, they're psychologists, they're retired high school administrators. They are people who have mastered their professional lives. And so it's incredibly brave to enter into an arena like painting where you feel like you have no mastery and you have that voice in your head, that critic, that editor in your head who is telling you, you can't do it. She's making it look easy, but it's not something I could do. So that's really the biggest thing I deal with as a teacher is, um, is dealing with fear. It is the big, the big freeze, right? We get frozen. We don't even try something that would be a very nominal expense and non nominal amount of time. We could do it in our, the privacy of our own kitchen on our dining room table. No one would even have to know about it, yet we don't do it because we are afraid of hearing that voice in our head that's going to tell us that we're no good. And it's a very powerful inhibitor. Working in simple ways like this, where we're mixing color. We're just making squares. I'm not making a painting. I'm simply finding out what these colors do with one another, with water and color and a brush. And I'm going to start again. I'm switching to Tom's um, watercolor blue, and I'm going to put in a little bit of this, this uh, yellow. And I'm mixing on the palette. I'm cleaning my brush between dipping back into the pure color just so that pure color doesn't get corrupted by the mixture, which is very easy to happen. And then I'm going to come down and make a square of that color that I mixed in the center of my palette using these tube colors. And there I have this gorgeous green. So I have a square of this kind of a cobalt blue, and then I have a square of what I think is maybe a Rolian yellow, and then this mixture of the two of them in the third square. And I have this array now of six 
different mixtures that are all showing me some of the ingredients in that green and then the green itself and the different greens that come out of this. And now I'm going to just do one more where I'm picking up more yellow. I'm picking up a little more blue to make it a little bit richer. And then I'm picking up just a little bit of red to, to create a green that is a little bit closer to the one of the natural greens we're going to see out here on the California coast in the redwood forest. So this green here is now what I would call naturalized or neutralized, where it has yellow, it has blue, and it has red. And so it's a bit closer to what I would call a mossy, a mossy tone, a natural tone. And I look around, I'm looking into a grove of redwoods as I'm sitting here on the backside of the Wallala Art Center in Wallala. And I'm looking at these magnificent redwood trees. So I see how much red is in some of these trees. And I'm going to actually make one more mixture that's all the same colors, but just a little bit more red. And this begins to really become almost a brown color, a little bit of a brownish tone, sort of a, a really subtle green. So I'm gonna let those sit and dry a little bit. And I'm gonna turn my paper around here and just take a look at my first, my first colors that I laid down. I'm gonna hold them up to the camera so you can see. Uh, this is a thing I do quite a bit when I'm doing watercolor. I take my paper and I and I look at it so the light can bounce off those colors and show me where it is still wet, if it is still wet. And that you can see there is more water still sinking in to those colors. And I'm going to expedite the drawing process with those just a bit because I want to come back on top of them with another layer of color. So I'm taking some tissue paper. And I'm just going to lift away a little bit of the extra pigment from that yellow. The rest I'm gonna leave be, but that one particular one had a lot of extra water sitting on top of it. It just was taking a long time. So I'm just taking off a little bit and that makes it kind of an interesting texture. Okay, so while that's still drying, I just wanna check in and see where, where, where we're at with time, because I don't want to go over and not allow other people in to share what they've been doing. Peggy, is that, am I, can you give me a time check on this? Is it 9.34 or 9.24? It, we're, we, you have, it's 9, 9.32. So you have okay. 20, about 27 minutes left. And listeners, you are tuned to KGUA in Guadalala, 88.3 FM, streaming globally at KG ua.org on the internet on the air pocket app and on youtube as we're watching i'm watching fascinated as aaron is making all of these colors out of three basics and it's so fascinating what happened when you added the red to that mm. uh to that and uh and seeing how much that is in nature here because when you know we call them redwood trees because of the red but it you know they're um needles uh depend on that redness to be the color they are it's, it's fascinating and that's it from me so you've got about 25 full great. minutes left. great oh thank you so much um so i'm mixing now going back to my my prang palette a green with these pigments um, so I've talked about some of the variables, the actual, the actual pigment you're using for the yellow or the blue is going to make a difference. Um, the brand you're using is going to make a difference, whether you're using uh, tube color or, or cake color, all of these things are factors in getting the color you want working wet into wet or working wet onto dry working in layers. Um, so I want to show you 
So these are all little squares we've just done. I want to show you what happens when I go back to this yellow and I paint blue over it. And this is a really something that kind of astonished me when I first saw it because it's really this optical mixing. You're not mixing yellow with blue as we've been looking at all of these ways we can make yellow and blue and neutralizing with red and all that. This is just pure yellow. And this is just a pure blue. And what I'm going to do here is take my fresh water, my fresh brush, and I'm going to mix up a pure blue. And I'm going to paint that over my pure yellow. So these pigments are not actually going to mix with one another on the page. They are going to stay intact and separate from one another. But I think even looking through the lens of this Zoom meeting, this Zoom gathering, you can actually see this becoming green. Oh, Tom is so sweet. He's just brought me my glasses. Okay, so that went from being yellow to being green. And it's not actually mixed green. It's just that your eye is perceiving the light bouncing through the blue, bouncing through the yellow, hitting that white paper and bouncing back up into your eyes. And in your eyes, your optical powers mix those two color vibrations and make green. So you're actually, your eyes are perceiving green out of just yellow and just blue. So I'm going to do the same thing now with yellow over the blue. So we'll see how that may look. I just think this is fascinating. And you, when you do um, traditional watercolor painting, you know, English style watercolor painting is what they called it when I was in school. What I found in that process was that artists would layer, they would paint one color and let it dry for 20 minutes to two hours. And then they come back and do a second color and then a third color and they would layer. And sometimes a painting might have 20 to 50 layers, which is a lot of time allowing the color to dry and then coming back and deepening and deepening. And these paintings were breathtaking. Um, there's a luminosity and a depth that you can get when you work this way that is unlike anything else. So I find for myself, I'm impetuous. I want to get paint happening. I want to get things going on. Um, and I didn't find that that method was really to my taste for myself, for my energy, but the people for whom that was their way of working, it was delightful and incredibly instructive. And one of my teachers once said, making art is all about patience. And it was certainly true in looking at these watercolor artists working in can layer. You, Aaron, art. can you name some of these artists that we might be able to see their work? Well, you know, that's actually a really good question. I don't, I don't know um, if I can. I, I kind of assume that Wyeth worked this way. Um, Andrew Wyeth worked in watercolor and he used and he painted nature in the most exquisite way. And I, when I look at his watercolors, I assume that's what he was doing was that he was really building up layer upon layer, but I haven't studied him. So I don't really know if he is actually doing that, but I, I kind of get that impression from looking at him. But the artists I was referring to were ones I was studying with in, in college. And um, I don't remember their names, I'm afraid. Um, so I can't help you with that. But I would like to actually open the floor at this point and just invite some of the people who are painting along with us today, if they would mind um, sharing with us, you know, the process for them and um, how it's going. Oh, and I can put my glasses on and read comments in chat. And I just want to remind people um, that when you when you're looking uh, when you're when you want to engage and I'd love to invite that engagement on the bottom of your screen there's a reaction button and if you touch it it's going to give you a bunch of options 
and one of them is raise your hand. And if you raise hand, Tom will see that you've raised your hand and then he will bring you in and we can have a little chat and we can talk about how things are going for you and, you know, how this color green exercise is going and, or whatever else, you know, when you start working in art, um, all kinds of things get stirred up that you might not have anticipated. So the conversation can, can start anywhere really. Um, so I just want to uh, read a couple of these comments that are so nice. And then one is a question as a beginner, how does one determine if a color is on the warm or cool scale? This is an incredibly uh, excellent question. Um, so warm and cool are kind of art words that um, are really confusing. And I have found them to be really confusing as a student of them, but they really are coming into play when you're looking at trying to get accuracy and color and a warm, a warm color, like a warm yellow tends to push toward orange and a cool yellow is going to push more toward apple green. Certain colors just make better oranges or make better purples and um, choosing in, in what we usually do when I paint tomorrow and I invite all of you to join me tomorrow, Saturday, I'll be doing a demo at 11 at the Sea Ranch Lodge. On my palette, you'll see I have a, a warm and a cool version of each primary color because when you're painting out of doors, you don't want to bring every single color that it was ever made because it's just too much to carry. But you can get a tremendous range if you have a warm and a cool version of each primary color. And then I usually have titanium white to lighten and some kind of a darkening agent, maybe Payne's gray, maybe burnt umber. So if I'm looking at something that's a very warm uh, green, it's got a lot of red in it. A cool green is going to have um, more yellow in it. It's not going to have uh, red. In purples, you're going to end up with more of a brownish maroon if you're using a, a warm red. If you're using a cool red, you're going to get something closer to lavender or a really clean hyacinth, you know, purple. So I sort of um, find that it's a comparative thing. You know, things are some things that are a warm yellow may be cool compared to a warmer yellow. So it's all about comparing. It's all about the relationships. Painting is all about relationships and colors, relationships and shapes, relationships in um, di the, di the proportions of your... Um, composition. So, you know, this is, this is all, um, this, <laughs> the theoretical, when it hits the page has to really be about the relationships between what are actually, what is actually happening on your painting. And you can say, well, this is a cool yellow, but it's actually going to be a warm yellow in certain contexts, depending on what your contexts are. So, there's the, there's that, but I would say that uh, the big place where I have struggled with warm and cool is in the color green, because if you pick up a warm yellow and you mix it with a warm blue, you're going to end up with brown. And that may not be what you want. You may really want a clean, crisp Granny Smith apple color, which is going to be a cool yellow and a cool blue. So these are fun games to play with yourself when you're working with, with, with whatever mediums you're working with, oil paint, acrylic paint, uh, watercolor paint. Um, and I think that's, that's, probably, that's probably the best way I can describe it. But I would love to have uh, participation from uh, some of you out there um, just to warm me up because um, I'm definitely, I, I definitely find that when one of my students out in the world chimes in, I, I get a little boost of energy and I'm sitting here with very cold fingers right now. So I could use it. It looks like Kim Webster has raised her hand. 
and maybe Tom will bring you in and we can have a chat. That would be fantastic. Hi. Hi. Um, this is what, what I did today. I used two different sets um, and neither one of them were really totally student grade. This is um, from Josie Lewis. She put together some um, uh, like a paint kit that people could buy. And then these beautiful colors, which don't look so, oh, here, that's better. Um, these are by Schminky in a, uh -huh. a kit that I bought at some groovy art store. Hmm. Very nice. And I mixed the, um, you know, I'm looking at what Tom put in the chat and it just doesn't make sense to me. Like which, like how a uh, warm blue tends to purple. I, I guess I get that. I really get confused about that. Yeah, you know, I think it's a language that is actually really unhelpful. I have to say, yeah. I remember when my first teacher who taught me about warm and cool was trying to explain it. And that was dec a decade or so ago. And what I have found to be really helpful is finding out which, which, which colors would mix well with other colors to get the colors I want. And that is much more helpful. It's simply experimenting to find out which colors give you the, the, the results you want. And warm and cool can be super helpful as a way to start that process. If you just go on to any paint manufacturing um, website and you add and you look for a warm, cool, warm and a cool version of any color, and then you do some experimenting with those mixes, you're going to find that that's going to give you the information you need. And then you pay attention to that. So I agree. I find it to be like as much as the theory. And also, I mean, I was doing this really intense color course where the uh, very famous professor, the learned professor, his um, call his what he called a warm blue was the opposite of what others were calling a warm blue. And I was just, oh, my God, if these very smart people and prof professorial art teachers can't agree on which is warm and which is cool i'm going to be hopeless at it so, so, so aaron, aaron do we all see colors the same i don't think so i really don't think so i mean we're all different in so many ways that we're going to perceive differently so at the end of the day what matters is enjoy the process of experimenting and pay attention to what you learn when you experiment and i think you could never even know that there were warm and cool versions of pigments and have a spectacular experience painting and never know you are missing out on understanding what that was. So, you know, if it's, if it's helpful, great. And if it's not helpful, find another way to you know, explore. That's what I would say. Sure. Cause you want to paint what you want to paint. Mm -hmm. Hey, let's, let's get, uh, are there more hands up from some of the see, yeah, let's, see, uh, let's see, this is D uh, Diane. Diane is joining in. Hi, Diane. Can you unmute yourself? Can you unmute yourself? All set. Okay, yes. excellent. Um, I had so much fun today. I'm here. I'm participating from New Hampshire. We're having a big snowstorm now, so um, don't feel anymore. so bad. <laughs> uh, so I had so much fun today just mixing these colors, and really, I'm completely new at this. Um, but I really just wanted to ask you about the water. My wow. water got incredibly gray. And I wondered whether I shouldn't have like many clean ones sort of to switch out as I work. Yes, you should. You should have a cup of clear water because sometimes you want to take just a drop of clear water and drop it into something that often is something mm. that you want to do. Um, but yeah, you're going to make dirty water and then it's going to be really frustrating. So make sure you have, you might want to have a bucket of clean water to replenish from and a bucket to dump old water into. Um, this is really important with water color painting because it, dirty water is going to change your colors. 
So you. yes, you absolutely should do that. I mean, I wish I could do that right here, but Tom's on one side of the building and I'm on the other. <laughs> There's no water spigot at hand. Actually there is, but I'd have to like go over and around and you know clamber through things. So yeah, you want to have water sources, water buckets, whatever works for you. Um, you know, yeah, it's important. Great. Thank you. you. You're welcome. It's where you can really can uh, be bring more control into working with a, a water medium is making sure you're keeping your brushes clean, you're keeping your palette clean, you're keeping your water clean. So like, you know, cleaning off your palette, the center of this, oh, I'm, let's see, my hands are, are gone. So the center of this palette is now pretty murky. So I'm going to go in there and I'm going to wipe it off with mm -hmm. my, my tissue paper and let that dry. Any pigment um, will be reawakened yeah. with more water. So drying off, and this is actually something one of my teachers who is a, a oil painting teacher, actually, he works mostly with oils. He cleans off his oil painting palette every 20 minutes. And one of the things that happens is you get a clean, clear surface to work on, which is really important, but it also forces you to make decisions about color mixing again and again. We can get really lazy and start just, oh, that must be a, the right color because it's there. And in fact, by the time you've been painting for 20 minutes, colors have managed to be created in your palette just because of stray, you know, the, the brush straight over into a color and introduced it in there. And again, that can be a happy accident and you might love it, but you might also find that it's an unhappy accident and you don't love it at all. So not to be lazy, but to be, you know, making art is not for the uh, lazy. <laughs> you, know, you really have to put a lot of energy into um, getting what you want and taking the time to learn what you, what, what you like this whole cool, warm question to me, which is, it's a, it's, you know, artists have conversations about cool and warm all the time. Mm -hmm. Just some people really don't understand how that, what that means. And it doesn't really speak to them. So I honor that because we're all different and for others, it's extremely helpful. And sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't. I'm going to just go back over my red now and show you that, oops, now that's still wet. I touched it and it dragged. So this paper in this really cold weather, it's like 30 degrees right now where I'm sitting. This cold weather is just not allowing for this paint to dry very well. So that's another factor. Um, temperature. There's the pigment, there's the water, there's the time and the temperature. So if I go on top of this mixture and I'm going to go on top of the uh, red and I'm just going to go on top of it with the green. This is the green that's already in the kit that I have. I'm going to see if that works to give us a more muted green. We'll see seems to me that it does. That red seems to not only darken the green, but it also neutralizes the green a bit. So I'm just going to let that dry and um, check in and see if we have anybody else out there who would like to participate in this conversation, or if you have any thoughts you'd like to share. I, I just want to point out to you that this you know, while you're summoning up your question or what you'd like to bring to the table, there's something so exquisite to me about, and I'm just going to lift this up and about what happens with water media. Here we go. I'm trying to figure out my angle because everything is upside down. Um, when you look at a at water and pigment. And as it begins to sink into the paper, you're going to notice there's some granulation happening where some of the pigment is really um, becoming apparent. And when it's completely dry, that granulation adds a certain texture that's so beautiful. And also there's a kind of a halo right here where I had my yellow first, and then I layered onto my blue 
Prasodam was there's this uh, vibration of that yellow being pure, intact around that field of green. Um, the red, similarly, that continues to exist around that color field. So you, as you do experiments, you might also notice something that ha is happening that you didn't intend to do, but that actually adds a, a color vibration that is really interesting. Uh, things don't have to be perfect. They don't have to be perfected. Sometimes these accidents that happen as you go along or these these byproducts of, a, of an exercise actually lead you to make a decision. You want to incorporate something like that, that uh, halo of red or that halo of yellow in your actual intentional work. And I see Deb has raised her hand. We have a few more minutes. Would you like to join in? Deb Ingram. Sure. Yay. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. I One thing I learned today is that it makes a difference if the paper is 100% cotton versus 25% because I I was not at all liking the way my um, the paint was moving and, and drying compared to what I'm used to. Mm, so yeah. I discovered that difference. I looked I looked back at the paper I usually usually like to paint with, which is 100% cotton. Yeah. Um, but I, I also wanted to thank you because I, I've been able to, to um, participate in many sessions with you and you've so helped me realize the, um, the joy of just like watching and observing. And, you know, I just love like the edges you were pointing out or the blooms or it, it's just so uh, meditative and uh, joy producing. So thank you, thank you. Oh, you're welcome, Deb. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I just want to encourage all of you to give yourself permission to simply explore because in that, in that exploration without a final product being attached to it, we discover the things that delight us. And in that discovery, we bring delight into the world, which we need more of than now than ever. Um, and so, you know, give yourself permission to really just play with this stuff and not put anything heavy on it. It doesn't need to be any more than just a delightful session of joyful exploration. Erin, I'm going to jump in. And as we wait, hopefully we'll have one or two more comments, but uh, we are running out of time. My heart is sad. It's been a, such a wonderful experience to join you and Tom and all of your wonderful artists. And I have learned so much and learned so much about my own inner fears. <laughs> you know, it's really, but I, I just, is such a wonderful process. So um, artists, you have about, Two minutes left before we have to officially say uh, goodbye to Aaron and to Peggy's place here on KGA and Walala. So there's a whole bunch of you there. There's 43. So maybe we have a few more comments. Hmm. Well, I'll also say um, just if you're in the Walala or the Sea Ranch area, come out and paint with me tomorrow. I'll be at the Sea Ranch from uh, all morning and into the afternoon. And then we have a wet paint reception at 4 p.m at the Sea Ranch Lodge. So you're so welcome to come out and bring your paint kits, your watercolors, your sketchbooks, your oil paints. And I think maybe uh, we can bring Meg on. Meg, you can uh, unmute yourself. Thank you, Erin. So I, I have a cobalt blue and I also, also have an indigo blue. Mm -hmm. Are those both considered cool colors? Or well, blue is a cool color compared to yellow or red. So definitely in that comparative world, blue is cool. In the world of blues, you're going to have blues that are warmer and cooler than each other. And um, cobalt and indigo are really different. Indigo almost is like has almost like a blackish aspect, doesn't it? It's it's yeah. um, this one here. Mm -hmm. It's the indigo. Oh, beautiful! And you can, you 
can see that it's very dark. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, then, and then, the, then the cobalt was more, whoops, over there. Right. Beautiful. Still running. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it it gave kind of a more violet color than black, I think. Wow, it's fabulous! Yeah, um, these I, are my messing arounds with. I love but, it. Those are gorgeous. Um, but anyway, I'm confused also about the whole cool warm concept. So yeah. Um, so and it's I think it's the hardest in blue. Blue is really tough because the blues are cold, cold, cool colors, and then within them there are ranges. So I often will use turquoise for a sunny sky. When I want a really sunny sky, I'll make a turquoise and I'll add a little yellow to my blue, or I'll use turquoise um, when I'm trying to get something really dark and blackish. You know that shadow in the water. I might use Prussian blue. Uh, indigo I don't really use in oils but it's a beautiful color and watercolor and I think we're out of time oh we are out of time Aaron uh, I'm going to give you another minute though for something else if you want to say one more thing and thank you everybody who has joined us today and through the last month I'm just going to say come out to the seven o'clock lecture tonight at Wallala Art Center. We still have tickets tomorrow. Join me all day painting and, you know, just get out and do it. You know, mastery is not the point. So explore, enjoy. It's how we become more human, tapping into that creative source. All right. It's going to be it. Thank you, Tom. Also so much pleasure working with you guys. I have to go. We're KGOA in Guadalajara, 88.3 FM. We're going to leave now and go to Albuquerque, New Mexico for Native American.